Our first speaker is Jordan Golengoff. He is a senior data scientist at Pandora. As a longtime customer, Pandora uses Bugsnag across multiple platforms, and Jordan is a member of the team that really helps drive adoption and process. As you can see, he has a pretty unique title. Senior data scientist is not something that is commonly found across many of our organizations. So Jordan really has a unique perspective and some great insights to share. And as a side note, in addition to a CS degree, Jordan also has a PhD in forestry. So I think that if we pull him aside for some great thought-provoking conversations, while you're having cocktails, he'll be able to talk a lot about the environment. <laughs> Sorry, Jordan, I volunteered you for that. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Jordan, all yours. Yeah, so if you have any questions about like seeing the forest for the trees, that sort of thing, um, pull me aside. Um, yeah, so before, uh, I guess my, my real focus is on main, making sure that listeners have the best experience they can at Pandora. Prior to Pandora, I was working on improving quality and sort of visualizing our manufacturing process while at Apple to make, make really high quality products there. And prior to that, I was 10 years in the woods dealing with real bugs. Um, <laughs> That's really not true. I was mostly behind a computer. That's why I ended up here. Um, but yeah, any forestry questions are welcome. So with that, um, I'll just jump right in. But before I do, I will say it's a blessing and a curse to go first, because I have no idea what you guys are going to say. <laughs> if I was going last, I might build on it. Um, but since I'm going first, I don't have to worry about being repetitive. So uh, good luck. Um, <laughs> So uh, I don't know if you guys, most of you have probably heard of Pandora. Has anyone not heard of Pandora, Pandora before? I'm sure you all are active Pandora users. We appreciate you. <laughs> There's all these other crazy companies out there that don't do it quite as well. Um, we were just acquired by SiriusXM uh, January, uh, January this year, and we're still in the process of combining. But as a result of this, um, combination of these two companies. We're now the largest streaming, streaming, or we kind of always have been, the largest streaming music provider within the US. Over 70 million listeners a month, or approximately, in, for Pandora, and in the neighborhood of 100 million, I think, across Sirius and Pandora. So we have a pretty um, large user base um, that uses our apps on all different forms across all different platforms every day. We have a mobile app, we have a web client, we have a desktop app that is basically a container for a web client, and we run on home devices like Sonos and Google Home and Echoes and all those sorts of things. Um, so we've got a lot going on, and it's, uh, it's a lot of data that's coming through. Um, so what we're going to talk about here is uh, what we all came to talk about, which is how we can better leverage Bugsnag to, to keep our quality high. Um, and so that's what we'll talk about today. So whenever we're talking about app quality and we're trying to figure out how should we prioritize app quality, obviously you all in this business know that you know, resources are always scarce. You never have enough engineers to do what you really want to do um, or in the time frame you want. And new feature development is really what you know, a lot of executives care about. Like That's the next new shiny thing that's going to move your business to the next level. It's a new feature that all your consumers really want. I'm going to step over here. And so uh, it's hard to carve out resources for quality. How, you know, how can we make the case that we need to improve our quality or that the app quality isn't as good as it should be? Um, and so that's really what Bugsnag helps us to do, along with a lot of other signals. But Bugsnag is one of our critical signals. How do we know when the quality of our app isn't what it should be and that we need to invest more resources in fixing it? And so um, that's. That's what Bugsnag data helps us to do. So anyway, what we're trying to get to is um, the holy grail here of how can we make data informed decisions? W what should we work on and how much energy should we put towards that thing? And how do we prioritize the, re um, the, the resources that we put against it? How big of a problem really is it? Um, that's what we want to get to. The way we get there is by having real time um, hourly app crash rates. We want to know exactly what's happening right now, and we want to be able to digest it and form insight so that we can take action. Um, 
And we want to do this sort of by app version and also linked to all of our other internal data that we have about the app um, process and experience. So we run a ton of A-B experiments. We want to be able to link back crashes to the experiences people are really having. And so um, that's how we're going to try to get to this data-informed state. OK, so now we're going to enter the portion of the talk where I show you a lot of icons. Um, some of these you may know. I hope you guys know about these guys since you're here. Um, and I'm going to tell you how our data pipeline works. So how do we take data and get to something that's useful to prioritize our work? Um, obviously, if you guys uh, are here, you know that people are using a client and the client dies, right? At that point, we lose visibility into what is happening on that client. And that's why we have Bugsnag. So then Bugsnag collects this data. And at that point, it goes into, uh, or they push data to Amazon SQS, which we can pull using, in this arrow zone, we have written uh, code that pulls Amazon SQS, applies some business logic to filter out things we don't really need. And that pushes it into our on-prem Kafka cluster. And Kafka and SQS are they're sort of glorified pipes. You put something in one end, it comes out the other end. So um, I'm sorry, you guys are, uh, some of these things, I like. I live with them, so I know what they are. But when I first started, my eyes glazed over <coughs> on some of this stuff, and I wasn't sure what they were. So um, this is just basically the piping. And then we go to a data warehouse, which is Hive, um, which can be on-prem, it can be in the cloud, wherever you, wherever, whatever makes you the happiest and makes your heart sing. Um, I'm joking. In any case, at that point, once it's in Hive, we can apply all of the joins to pull in all of our relevant business logic and internal data. And then we push it out to Anadot, which is our anomaly detection system. It's a vendor we use. Um, and we also have a Tableau instance where we are digesting this data and visualizing it in real time. So this is our basic stack. The interesting thing about this, and from my perspective as a data scientist, um, we want to have all of this data on in-house, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud, we don't want to ever get rid of it because eventually, long-term, we want to make predictive models, predictive analytics about churn, about where to spend marketing resources, about how to predict you know, teams that might need a little bit more support to make better quality products, um, to understand all these things. We need to be able to have a really rich data record that we can look back in time and see user behavior correlated with the bug data that we collect. So it's critically important for us to ingest everything. Not everyone has that need, but we, we feel that that's important. And the other thing to note is that like, I'm not a client engineer. Our lead iOS developer uh, engineering manager is here, Dave Blundell. Um, and you know, he knows what he's doing, and his team is great. Um, but I don't. So they own this portion of it. Bugsnag obviously owns this. We have a, whole, we have a data engineering team that helps with the ingestion process. And then our team basically takes over here. And we uh, help with the sort of data munging and getting everything in the way that we, the, in, into the format that we need, and making visualizations and the alerts that we want to use to drive our decisions. But the reason I'm talking today is because at the end of the day, um, you, I could say that I'm the owner of this pipeline. I care about it uh, as much as anyone else does. I'm sure Dave cares about it too, but you know. Um, he doesn't have a lot of insight into the end of it as the final end user. And I, and I think our team does. Um, so here's, now we have this data pipeline that we've established where we're sending really valuable data to, um, to Bugsnag and pulling it out into our on-prem system. And what we, and this, what you're looking at is actually what we use. This is an Anadot um, visualization where you can see the number of bugs, the number of listeners that experience a crash per hour over a period of time. And we've established a pretty naive um, threshold where above which we know we have a problem. And at some point, we cross the threshold. And so when that happens, we have automated alerts that come, that go out to Slack or email or really wherever you want um, from Anadot. And that pings engineers, our team, managers. Um, and at that point, the question is, we have a problem. What do we do? And so at that point, we have some in-house um, Tableau dashboards where we can look at this. And 
basically, whenever we're thinking about bugs or about crashes, we, we care about the number of crashes, the absolute number, but we really care about the number of listeners. If 1,000 listeners have a crash, that's bad. If there's a million crashes, that's bad. But you know, we, if, it, it's sort of like if one listener has 999,000 of those <laughs> crashes, like, that's not quite as bad. That guy, I feel bad for that person, and I don't want that to happen. But from an impact perspective, you know, that's from driving our resourcing and bug fixing, that's an outlier. Um, whereas when we're thinking about it from a listener basis, what you're looking at in this graph, and this is how we actually start to get to the fix, is we're looking here and we're saying, okay, well, this app version has more crashes per, has more listeners with crashes as a percentage of total listeners than these app versions. And in fact, this blue line, you know, that might be where we want to focus our effort. That's likely our, our top uh, app in production right now, our top app version. And so from that, then we can say, okay, well, for that specific app version, which crash has the highest, um, is the most dominant? And so that's where we can go here. And then we can go into Bugsnag and look at their UI and say, okay, well, like there was a spike here. And imagine that in, at, when we're getting this in real time, it wouldn't have resolved itself. This resolved because we found it and we turned off the experiment that was driving this crash. And now we have a success story where we've limited the sort of blast radius of a, of a problem. Um, and so this is sort of our general flow. Um, and this happens with more frequency than you'd want. But um, <laughs> the sort of state we were in before this was that you know we would come in to work on a Monday and learn that over the weekend we'd had a crash event, right? Like, and if you're getting your quality signals from your app reviews or from emails from your listeners, you have failed, in my opinion, because that's too late. And the things that listeners write are vague and not you know, as action-oriented uh, as you might like. So whereas for this, once we get to this point where we can isolate, OK, for this app version, we've got these two errors we need to look into, these two crashes. We found it. It looks like that's a problem. You know, with the sort of full stack trace that, and breadcrumbs that Bugsnag provides, now we really can get into the meat of fixing these things. And in some cases, it's as easy as turning something off. In other cases, it's actually pushing out a new patch for an app version or a new app version release. But you know, without this data, we can't know how to manage our ramp processes. We can't know when we have problems until often it is past the point where we'd be comfortable having that problem. So that's the, the meat of how this works for us. I'm not sure if I'm uh, way over time or under time or doing OK. Great. Um, I will say I really appreciate the Grace Hopper stuff. That's awesome. Um, take home messages. So this is, this is basically it. Um, Bugsnag crash data really allows us to quickly find and diagnose what's happening to our listeners that's problematic. And we use this every day, and it helps us drive how many engineers we put on things, how urgent we think that the problem should be based on our crash rates. We have top level uh, objectives and key results based off of our crash rates. And that drives resourcing from a quarterly planning perspective. Like, I can't overstate how important it is for us to have this crash data and to have it as quickly as we, as we have it, to have it as real time as we have it. Um, the second um, take home is that for us, um, drilling down by the feature, so once we take the bug snag data and join it back with all of our internal business data around experimentation and app versions um, and listener, other listener behaviors, that really allows us to get to a resolution so not only do we find the thing, but then we can have a better idea of what's driving it and how to fix it. Um, and last but not least, right now, um, we, we're, we, we are very cautious about SDK uh, version bumps, because when an SDK fails and that causes a crash, that feels really bad to us. So we're, not to say your guys' SDK is bad, it usually is great, but um, so we're a little delayed on some of this, but I know that um, we're excited to see more of this non-responsive error stuff come through because although crashes are horrible, in many ways a non-responsive state is even worse. And so if we could get that data and use that to inform our metrics um, for iOS and Android and web and other platforms, that would really be, um, that would really help us to ensure that the, the, our quality signals are more complete and we're not missing anything. Um, so I think that's it for me. Thank you guys for coming.
You were talking about how you correlate crash um, Boxnet data with internal tooling and analytics. Can you talk a little bit more how you find this correlation between spikes and crashes and experiments turning on like new features being launched? What's the bridge between the two? Right, so, um, and uh, I'm, I'm gonna say things here that are gonna be corrected theoretically by other people, but when we send data to Bugsnag, we are also sending information about what experiments listeners are in. We're sending listener IDs. We're sending a bunch of proprietary information along with that the app is populating in Bugsnag that's going back to Bugsnag. When we pull that into our on-prem or our data warehouse, wherever it is, we can then join against that. So for example, if you are a Pandora listener, then you're in some suite of experiments. You just suffered a crash. We can take that data and say, okay, well, you were in the bottom navigation experiment. Maybe that's the problem. And now when we have you know, a thousand crashes, we can start to see, well, if the experiment is at 1% of our listeners, but we're seeing more than that experiencing a crash, say, or if it's an experiment, it's actually, if we're seeing it like the treatment of the experiment is experiencing this crash at 50%, but the control is not experiencing it, then we can say, okay, well, we found it. And we do that all the time. Whenever we have an app release and we see, or when, when we're running these experiments and we see a elevated crash rate in the treatment, then we'll go back and say, well, which errors are driving that? Which crashes are driving that elevated crash rate relative just for that experiment from treatment to control? Does that answer your question? Yeah, um, I was wondering how you allocate resources to deal with these bugs. So let's say you identify yeah. that this is the top bug. Uh, is it part of the on-call rotation or like? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, well, so again, um, I have no power, and so I'm not an engineering manager. So when we have a problem, um, oftentimes it is my job to sound the alarm or at least to raise the problem but I am not the one to say who works on it. Um, we do have pretty well established and historical crash rates. And so when we see our crash rates go above a, a certain amount, it does cause people to move into uh, to working on those things. We have a two week uh, app release cycle during which time we have like a dedicated team doing quality issues. Um, and we have a ramp, you know, during that release, two week release cycle, we're doing sort of a phased ramp generally. And so if we see, um, the nice thing about normalizing any, everything to the number of listeners, so you're seeing a percentage of listeners with experiencing a crash, is you can start to compare across the full ramp of a release. And um, what that does is then you could say, okay, well, we're only at 1%, but we're seeing a spike in this percentage of listeners experiencing a crash. Should we continue the ramp? And that's sort of the resource, that, that's part of the resource. That's not exactly an answer to your question, but that tells us when we should turn the ramp off or patch theoretically. Um, and so if it's deemed that the crash is not uh, big enough, or that crash is not big enough to turn the ramp off, then that will drive resources for the next app release in that two week sprint, if that, is how, if that makes sense. Um, but that is generally, it's a bigger discussion. When we see these crashes, then it's sort of the, the quality engineers in concert with the um, engineering managers for the clients and making and, and sort of even se more senior people making a decision about, okay, does this warrant a patch? Should we pull people off other things? I'm just curious, uh, how's your guys' phased ramp? Like, do you guys take like uh, two weeks to go to zero to 100%, two days, three days? What does that look like? Uh, it depends. Um, Dave is probably a better person to answer that. I'll let him handle this one. I'm on the iOS side, so um, we just follow the App Store Connect um, phase ramp, like the five days or seven days. I don't actually follow it that closely these days. But um, uh, yeah, so if all is going well, then that's what we'll do. But we, we check a, a few different signals, Bugsnag being one of them, um, to see if the crash rate's too high, and we'll pause it if need be at that point. And then, you know, sometimes it's like if it's in a gray area, then you pause it just to buy yourselves time to make a decision before it goes any further, right? <clears throat> uh, that's pretty easy and free, right? Um, so, yeah, I guess that's, that's about it. So we might end up pausing it and just like wait till the next release in that case. I really wish that iOS had the ability to pause both automatic and manual updates, but unfortunately, maybe in a couple of years. 
Um, hi, Matt from Strava. Um, I'm curious, so at the end of this pipeline, you know, say you, you have this, you have, you have some owner that you mentioned. Um, in general, do you guys have a, a, a general path that you take to go from, say, you know, a line in a source file to the owner of, like, that file, that module? Like, what is the general pathway to get some particular person that can be alerted when there is, you know, you have, you have a very, a very yeah. pinpoint signal? Yeah, well, um, I used Strava this weekend. Um, well, I didn't, but I was with people who did, and I appreciated the, uh, yeah, the read out there. Um, yeah, so, but generally, you're right. So we get a pretty good signal. Even I, who's, who I'm not no developer, can go and say, this is the problem. And then it is raised to people like Dave or his Android or web counterparts. And then generally, at that point, just by looking at the stack trace, they can see, this is the person who worked on this. Who let the, who, got, who let this through basically, um, and so that is often the way that that person then gets assigned to it from their manager. Often that person will just say, "Oh, that was mine," and um, we've got a strong culture of that. Um, but in some cases, it, when it requires more effort than, or it's not quite as clear, then the engineering managers will generally say, "Okay, this is a problem. Can you take that?" And I think that's how it goes. We're posting these things in pretty broadly read channels for all engineers on a given platform when it happens. The alerts go to those channels and our team as well. So it's a, people are stepping up and if they don't, then I can ring the bell again and say, hey, what's going on? Or other people take that role too. So uh, considering you're building this pipeline out, outside Bugsnack, how much time and resources do you spend in creating and maintaining this pipeline? Um, I think it took us, it, it, you know, there is a fair bit of work. And um, we're always uh, making improvements and tweaking our visualizations to have them allow, uh, allow us to have greater insight into the problem. Like what I'm showing you here, that's good. I have some ideas how I'd make it better. Bugsnag has a lot of good resources and that's why we pay them because they are building out some of these visualizations too that they see across the industry are helpful. Um, but to answer your question, I think our sort of end to end for the internal tool to scrape the data pushed into our streams and everything. I think that was, I'll say one to three months of one engineer's time. A very good engineer, but, um, and then it's continuous improvement of the reporting tools and of the, uh, mon of the um, anomaly detection, how we wanna play with that. So that is sort of a day, a day a week, you know, or a day every sprint, every two weeks maybe. Uh, so I was wondering if, um Outside of incidents, are you, uh, do you have a way that you're providing uh, this data to your engineering teams um, as more of a, to allow them to take more proactive or preventative measures um, based on, based on the, the data that you're gathering and interpreting? Outside of like spikes, you mean? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I th I th well, I think, well, certainly, um, whether we have a spike or not, we have these bug busters sort of rotations and it is my hope and desire, and I believe it is true, that we use um, this, this graph here, whether we're having a spike or not, to tell us what to go tackle. Like, if, if you're seeing crash, like, you're always gonna have crashes, you should probably fix, my belief is, you should fix your worst, you name the number, it's hard to fix more than two or three in a, in a sprint. It's hard to fix one sometimes in a sprint, but you should be tackling that top three every sprint to continue to chip away at your quality or to improve it. And so that's sort of the, the approach we take, whether we're having a, a, whether there's a fire burning or, or it's just sort of normal stuff. David. We, we do try to, from every release, regardless of that's, if that's like a spike or anything, um, we try to address the top 10 crashes. Um, of course, over time, those get pretty well baked and those become really hard to fix and there might be like two new ones that are easy. Um, the problem that this causes over time though is like if you're only looking top 10, then you've got a long tail that might take like two seconds a nullability check or something like that, right? And there might be like 15 of those hiding in your top 100. Um, and that's something I've kind of more recently tried to get more of a process in place just to, you know, review these on a, you know, every other month or something, some kind of basis, just do a quick scan through the top 100 to see if, like, those stack traces look easy. We get a lot of questions. Um, I, I do have a question. Do you actually um, only check live, live 
bug snag analytics or, or do you actually run on all of your environments including dev sandbox staging uh, that's a good question we we have bug snag as, as the SDK is integrated across all of our uh, environments and so we're getting data in different uh, stages but since my focus is purely live production that's what I'm looking at I don't think Certain projects, like if we have a big experiment, like our For You page just went live recently, right? Like they might look at internal usage where we've whitelisted a bunch of employees internally. Yeah. I think like from my perspective, the power of Bugsnag is that we have a lar really large sample size. We're going to see the signals. When you're doing it in dev, like you might have 100. It depends on your beta process, but yeah. Um, so um, in that, in that pipeline, uh, I was wondering what kind of delay do you have between when, I guess when the crash happens and when you see it on the graphs at the other end of your pipeline? Um, so technically, uh, I think bug snag to SQS is pretty immediate. And um, we are polling SQS, I think, every five minutes. And so that's pushing into Kafka and rolling up at probably a 15 minute delay into Hive. And then um, just from a processing perspective, because we have to do all these joins and you know, we're getting it onto our dashboards at an hourly. So we're usually, and because of all of this, we're usually about between an hour and two hours delayed on the dashboard. And that feels really good when it used to be a couple days. Um, but yeah, um, and usually even if you have it an hour, like I guess the big picture is even if you had it within a minute, you'd still wait for an hour to make sure it wasn't a, you know, anomal like a, no a noisy signal, right? So it feels okay to have it at that time frame, I think. It hasn't been something we were worried about at this point. All right, well, thank you guys for coming.